thank you. I'm back. <laughs> you do not want to see me dance. <laughs> oh, it's great to be back again. It's always an honor um, and a privilege, so thank you. Good to see familiar faces, some new faces. How many of you uh, were here last year? How many not here last year? Let's do that. Not here last year or didn't see the video of last year, right? So a lot of hands go up. So last year we presented uh, some new research. It was hot off the press. Literally it just came in. Um, and we've taken that research further this year. And I'm really um, actually blown away by what we keep learning. And so uh, for those of you who were not here last year, I need to kind of get you oriented and then we can um, move into what's new. Uh, what we did, uh, frankly what we did was we were scratching our heads because I've been down here so many times like what do we have to say that's new, right? So we did this study and what we decided to look at was what does leadership look like from a street view? How do leaders talk to other leaders about leadership? What works, what doesn't work, what you need to do about it. And uh, we turn to our uh, norm base of written comments. Well, we're just about to go over a million surveys in our, in our database. That's going to be a marker, right? Um, and so we have this vast collection, you know, of leaders talking to other leaders about leadership. And as far as I know, uh, I haven't seen a study like this, frankly. So we reported on it last year, we've taken it further this year, and uh, I want to get you into that. So I'm going to set some context, then I need to orient some of you to the leadership circle profile really briefly, and then um, we'll get right into the study of uh, leaderships describing leadership. And then um, principles for change that are coming out of this, uh, and wrap up with a case study. So that's our... It's a cardiopulmonary event for me. I got a lot to cover because I got to cover everything we covered last year plus what we did this year, we're doing this year, so here we go. I started my career working on personal mastery and empowerment. And uh, early definition was um, this one, creating outcomes that matter most. And if you think about it, if you can create through your life, through your leadership, what matters most, well, that's a pretty good definition of self-mastery. So how do you let go to the life that wants to come through? And let it live you. Great leaders do that. They orient on their highest aspirations on a purpose that's worthy of their deepest commitment. We're going to see that in the written comments. But leaders, that's required for leadership but not sufficient. So leadership is Scaling that capacity in others. Scaling the capacity and capability of the organization to create outcomes that matter most. This is kind of our working definition of leader, great leadership. And so we'll see how that comes through in the comments. And so this notion of scaling is an interesting one. So does your leadership scale? We were at Disney with, uh, with Andrew Milstein and he says, you know what? Our leadership was exposed at scale. That when we tried to go from one film a year to two films a year or more, we tripped all over ourselves. Our leadership was exposed at scale. So uh, what we see leaders grappling with all over the world is um, they want to move up. And so does your leadership scale to the complexity that comes with that? They're doing that when the organization is saying let's 2x, 10x growth. And with that comes in even greater complexity. And we're doing it in a VUCA reality, which we just talked about, this edge, edgy reality, where we're challenged to literally be reinventing the organization real time to be more agile, more creative, more innovative, more um, everything that we're trying to do in organizations. Does your leadership scale to that context? And we're doing all that at once. How do we create the capacity and capability in the organization to deal with this? So leadership at scale. Now, 
How many of you would agree, I'll come, I'll come to that in a minute, how many of you would agree that leadership matters? Right? It matters to everything we hold dear, right? It matters to organization performance, to the fulfillment of people in the organization, to culture, to whether we achieve on our mission, our vision, our values, everything we hold dear. Leadership touches everything. So the effectiveness of leadership, both individual and especially collectively, how we show up together, uh, is a big deal. That's why we're here, right? We know this. Here's the thing. I think we know what it looks like. We've heard for years this notion that leadership is the most studied, least understood. You've heard that? I don't think it's true anymore. I actually think we know what it's looked like. And I think we know how to develop it. And a lot of what Lisa and I want to talk about today is I think we know how to develop that. So here's what great leadership looks like. Now, those of you who are familiar with the leadership circle know what this is and know what this looks like. For those of you who aren't, um, let me tell you what you're looking at, right? So, um, this is a perfect leadership circle profile. This is my profile. <laughs> Not. I'll tell you some stories about that. So let me just orient you briefly, real quick. So, top half of the circle, out here is an array of 18 key competencies that are well researched by the field to relate to effectiveness and leadership and business performance. All right? So here's our data on that. This is the average score in the, in the top half of the circle. The average score on all 18 key competencies correlated against the measure of leadership effectiveness that's on our survey. Now the measure looks like this. It's five questions that basically ask people to respond to overall how effective are you as a leader. And then we correlate this scale with the average score in the top half, we get a .93 positive correlation. High or low? Pretty high, which means as your creative competencies or your scores go up in the top half, what's gonna happen to your leadership? Up or down? Up, and highly likely so, okay? You got the top half. Bottom half, reactive tendencies. I struggle to talk about these because I don't have any, <laughs> but uh, they are strengths run reactively. Greg's over here laughing because he, he knows, he's worked with me, knows a lot better. They are strengths run reactively. And we'll talk about what this means. They are not weaknesses. So when we run our strength, our core strength, through a reactive structure, it has liabilities associated with it and consequences. And so our data on reactive tendencies is that they're inverse to effectiveness. So uh, as your reactive tendencies go out, what's going to happen to your perceived effectiveness, up or down? Up or down, and this is a pretty good solid inverse correlation. So that's the profile. Now, that's pretty much all you need to understand, right? So you want to see high scores in the top, and low scores on the bottom. Everybody can follow that? Now in the leadership circle, scores radiate from center. So they're like bar charts that radiate from center. So you can see this is a very creative profile. Not much reactivity going on. And these are percentile scores, which I'm not gonna get into all of that, but we, uh, these are normed against our norm base of now a million surveys, so uh, you're ranked against. When you see that, that would be higher than 90% of the leaders that we see. Here's where this came from. We asked 50,000 leaders around the world to describe optimal leadership. And this gets to the VUCA. The question we ask gets to the VUCA environment that we just talked about. What's the kind of leadership that if it existed in the organization would allow the organization to thrive in its current marketplace and into the future? And this is the picture we get consistently all over the world. Some variation in the bottom half, which we can talk about later maybe, but the top half is remarkably stable all over the world. So I think we know what works. And if that's the case, then um, it should show up in written comments.
So we uh, turned to our database and it blew us away. So we wanted to see how leaders describe leadership. As they provide feedback to each other, this is a very interesting conversation that's going on. Here's what works for you, here's what's not working for you, here's what you need to do about it. So we did it. And we wanted to see what the difference was between the most creative and the most reactive leaders. Now, we sorted our database a lot of different ways, but we were looking for executives, senior positions, large organizations, at least five direct reports, which means it's a substantial uh, position, uh, no more than two people from the organization, and we wanted to keep normative differences out of it, cultural differences out of it, so we stayed with English speaking and more Western countries, Australia, New Zealand, US, UK, Canada, and so on. We used the leadership quotient that we introduced in the book, Mastering Leadership, to sort the database. And the leadership quotient is a simple number. Uh, it's the top half divided by the bottom half. So your creative score divided by your reactive score. If these are even, you have an LQ of one, right? What's a multiple of one? So well, part of what we're looking at around leadership and scale is do you get a multiple on your leadership? So if your uh, leadership quotient is one, you're in the hunt, you're competitive, but you may not be yet a competitive advantage. Less than one could be competitive disadvantage, greater than one competitive advantage. So this is a very interesting number. And um, we used it to sort our database. So here's what we did. Statisticians did this. This was an independent study. They use that number and we get on one end, 28% uh, high creative, low reactive. Right, high creative, low reactive, high reactive, low creative. So this is 56% of our norm base, but that's what we reported last year. Then we filled in the middle. So that's one stage of what we wanna talk about today. What do, how does that look all the way through? So we're literally looking at this. What's the leadership look like of the extended leadership team of large, mostly Western organizations? What works, what doesn't, and the entire spectrum in between. Highest creative, lowest creative, and everything in between. So, executives, we sampled 100 in each, each group. 50 in the middle groups, because we'd already established the protocol and the researchers said we don't need to do 100, we can get by with 50. So there's 300 leaders in this study, 50 in the high creative, or 100 in the high creative group, 100 in the high reactive group, and 50 in the middle, got it? All right, and um, here's the data. Here's the demographics. About 60-40, about 62% male, 38% female. This is consistent with our norm base, which is, more, which is more male than female. However, look at how things sorted here. In the highly reactive group, only 22% were female. In the high creative group, they were overrepresented. Underrepresented in our norm base and overrepresented in the high creative group. We did this yesterday with a group and the woman stood up and cheered in the audience. It's like, I have been one, right? And I, my wife has been trying to tell me this forever, right? It's like, we consistently see and experience that women are evaluated uh, more creatively than men. And I think, especially as you look at this data and the emphasis on relationship, women are bringing a needed corrective. So stay with this. So anyway, so then you've got 237 companies, 29 industries, six countries, and over 4,000 raters. This is a large study. So let's start here. Now this is where I'm gonna fly because we covered a lot of this last year for those of you who are last year, but let's start here. Uh, how, are, how different are these two groups? So let's start with the quantitative data first. Here's the leadership so circle profile of the high creative group. Here's the leadership circle profile of the high reactive group. Could those be more different? 
right? Now, this is not surprising. We sorted for this, right? So you would expect this. What the statisticians didn't expect was how different they were statistically. So there's this measure called effect size, and I won't get into it, but it's a measure of um, would these leaders show up effectively different in the workplace? If you get over 0.3, the answer is yes. The differences between these two groups were in the neighborhood of point, uh, four and a half to six and a half. Point three is like, okay, it's going to be an effective difference. So these are hugely different groups. So then the question becomes, well, how does that show up? Or does it show up? So we turn to our comments. Here's the question we ask in our data, in our, in our 360. What's this person's greater, uh, greatest leadership asset, skill, or talent? And where are their opportunities for development? We have 1,350 pages. Again, a lot of data. Sorted into 77 categories, 40 strengths, 40 themes. They bucket. What they do is they do a content analysis. They look at all this data and they say, what are the key themes? So they bucket into 40 different themes for strengths and 37 different themes for liabilities. And then they keep score. How often were those themes mentioned? And that's what we're going to call the endorsement score. How often were leaders endorsed on a given strength or liability? Now here's how they did the math on the endorsement scores. If uh, the folks here in the front row are evaluating me on leadership, and one of you says, uh, he's pretty courageous, I get a half a point for the theme of courage. Got it? If three or more say I'm courageous, I get a full point. If 20 of you say I'm courageous, I still only get a full point. So the maximum score any one leader can get on a given theme is one. So if there's 100 leaders in the group, what's the maximum score that could be for the whole group on any one? 100, right? Be very unlikely, but that's how the scoring works. You follow that? All right. Um, so let's look at strengths of creative leaders. Here are the top, oh, let, no, let me just read. This would be an example of the kind of statement that would be scored. Jerry's a kind of leader who challenges and motivates you to do the best. You feel comfortable stretching because you know he won't second guess you with a judgment call. If he disagrees after the fact, he will turn it into a situation, a situation into a learning opportunity ra uh, rather than offer unproductive criticism. Top 10 strengths as seen by leaders of the most effective leaders, the most creative leaders. Top 10 strengths. Look at this. Now, here, you're going to see a lot of these. So here's how they're organized. Over here, in blue, are the bar charts for the creative, high creative leader group. The corresponding scores for the high reactive leader group are over here in red. And these are bar charts with the number along the side. So you can quickly go back and forth and see the differences in terms of how they were rated on this set of strengths. So just take a look at this. It becomes pretty powerful right away. Number one, number one, strong people skills. And look at the difference. An endorsement score of 79 to 28. Visionary, 76 to 54. Pretty strong vision in the reactive group. Um, team builder, approachable. Leads by example. Passion and drive we're going to talk about throughout. Reactives were actually rated higher on drive and passion than um, creatives. And then we think that's significant, and we'll talk about that. Right? Good listener, 46 to 3. Develops people, 46 to 11. Empowers people, positive attitude. It's quite a list. I hand this list out. And in one group that did a year's worth of work, one of the leaders put it on a wall. He said, this, is, uh, this shifted my leadership. This is a powerful frame for what works. 
And it's not us saying it. This is leaders talking to leaders. Strengths of reactive leaders. Love this. We said this quote last year, but I couldn't resist it this year. It's just too good. Paul's greatest strength is his keen mind. He's absolutely brilliant, has a powerful and unique combination of technical savviness, business acumen, and a reptilian charisma. <laughs> I like him already, actually. Uh, I love this quote. But it actually gets, it says everything about the strength and the liability of a high reactive leader. Strengths on a reactive structure, introduce liability. So let's look at that. So here are the strengths. Over here are the scores. This is the top 10 strengths of the most highly reactive leaders in our study. Number one, drive and passion. Two, visionary. Strong networker, good on technical stuff, good domain knowledge, results focused, intelligent, if not brilliant, strong people skills, but that shows up on the list, but the difference is 79 to 28. Big difference. Creative and innovative, personal, approachable, positive attitude. It's a good, strong set of strengths. And it's a very different set than the most creative leaders. Now, if you go back to the other list, right? Creative leaders were endorsed 2.3 times more often than reactive leaders on the, on the creative strengths. So if you take this total number over here, where'd it go? Uh, 544 versus total number over here, 240, you get a 2.3 times difference. That's a huge difference. Now on the strengths that the creative leaders were, or the reactive leaders were endorsed for, creative leaders are still endorsed 1.3 times higher. Follow that? So 1.3 times higher on the things that reactive leaders are most noted for, and 2.3 times higher uh, when you're looking at the strengths of creative leaders. Big difference between these two groups of leaders and the way the comments display them. All right, here are the biggest gaps. Between the strengths of creative and the strength of reactive leaders. Look at these numbers. And look at the list. Strong people skills, 51 point different. And look at this. Good listener, team builder, leads by example, down below is person of integrity, develops people, personal approachable, calm demeanor, empowers people, visionary. If you combine this list with the top 10 list of creative leaders, you're looking at the key differentiators for what makes for extraordinary leadership. We'll show you that list in a minute. All right, one more round and then I'm gonna have you take a short conversation to digest it. So, liabilities of reactive leaders. Top 10 liabilities of reactive leaders with the corresponding scores for creative leaders. There's nothing over there. In fact, the only, the largest score of li on the liability side for, cre for creative leaders was no challenges. In other words, people actually wrote in, I can't think of anything here. The second and the only two that showed up at any magnitude were um, workaholic and overworked. In other words, they're uh, pushing pretty hard. Other than that, there was nothing over there. So, Ineffective interaction style, 63 to 6. Not a team player. Team isn't fully developed. Over demanding, micromanaging. Team's not held accountable. Poor listener. Lacks emotional control. Impatient. Uh, yikes. <laughs> right? I never do any of this stuff, but. So. So what? Now, you have a handout that looks like this. And on that list are the definitions of the top 10 strengths of creative leaders in blue and the top 10 liabilities of reactive leaders in the, in the red or magenta uh, list, okay? So what I want you to do is turn to a partner 
And um, so what? Here's the questions you might think about. What strikes you so far? I've put a lot out there, uh, most of which we covered last year. What strikes you? What are the implications? Have a short conversation. Few minutes, we'll start back up again. Okay, have at it. One more minute, finish up. your conversation. I will put you in a second conversation later. Finish up. All right. So workshops are meaningful discussions interrupted by lecture. Workshops, meaningful discussions interrupted by lecture. So, so what? Let me just give you a couple of mine. One of them. There's a lot we could say here. We were surprised by the predominance of relationship stuff in this data. You look at this list of what differentiates, it's all people, 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 people. So, uh, get this. These are senior people talking to senior people about what really works. What makes for an extraordinary leader? The ability to be in a relationship at scale is a non-negotiable the higher you go. In relationship at scale, non-negotiable. I was here a few years ago and we talked about a, a great leader, Jim McGrain. Jim, got, uh, Jim was an extraordinary entrepreneur and his leadership circle profile was one of these great big 80 percentile beautiful profiles. Then the recession hit. He went from 80 to 50. When he got his second round of results, it was a huge wake-up call. By the time we met with him two days later, he'd had 25 meetings with 40 of his key directs, key, key stakeholders. He put both profiles out, the 80 percentile and the 50 percentile profile. He says, tell me what happened to me and what I need to do about it. He got an earload. When we met with him, he said, okay, I get it. I'm the problem. 
At a time when my organization knows, most needed me to be creative, I want reactive, I want minus. Furthermore, and more importantly, I thought my leadership effectiveness was enough. I'm getting that if I want to scale this organization, I got to scale leadership. That's my primary job. Enhancing or scaling the capacity and capability of the organization to create outcomes that matter most. It's what great leaders do. Now there's another story. Jim passed, as some of you know, he died. And one of the leaders that was um, very influenced by Jim has gone on to um, other organizations. He's now the CEO of a large publicly traded company. His profile, we just got his fourth profile over 10 years. His profile has gone from somewhere in the 10th percentile when he first started, really highly reactive, to 85th. Scaling leadership, scaling capacity. That's the legacy of Jim. And that's really what we're here to talk about. So when Lisa's speaking, it's going to be about how do you really um, work that in a way that's transformative. So that's one of the so what's. Now there's a lot more here. Um, as I <laughs> said to some of you, I, I, love, I love numbers. What can I say I do? When I get stressed, I turn to spreadsheets and fiddle around and it's like a puzzle that I can go into indefinitely. <laughs> And uh, so one day I'm looking at all this data and I sit down and I go, I wonder what the smallest gaps are. Are we looking at the biggest gaps? What are the smallest gaps? And I quickly run the numbers and it blew me away. So here are some of the smallest gaps. Think about this. In the, these are the top 10 strengths of highly reactive leaders. But they're, uh, most of them are what we call non-differentiating strengths. In other words, senior leaders, uh, most creative, most effective leaders are equally endorsed on these strengths as the most reactive leaders. So they don't differentiate leadership. And this is six out of the top 10 for highly reactive leaders. Does your leadership scale? High drive and passion, it's actually an inverse gap. Drive is higher. Then you get into good networker, technical domain, results focus, intelligent, brilliant, creative, innovative, and some of these are higher. So 25 on creative, 14. Intelligent, 29, 18. So get this, equally talented groups, and if you had to give the talent quotient, <laughs> you'd give it to the, creative or the reactive leaders. Highly talented group of people, but being experienced very differently as a group of leaders. Highly talented, if not equally talented, but very different. So these things are essential. You don't get to these positions without them, but they're table stakes for leadership. And if you think about it, if you're running your leadership through your own creative genius, through your own brilliance, it doesn't scale. It's not necessarily developing that capacity and capability in the organization, not built for scale. We run into it all the time. Brilliant leaders making a huge contribution. They're getting results. But then when you try to scale it, it doesn't scale. It becomes a bottleneck. Non-differentiating strengths. Necessary, not sufficient. What got you here won't get you there. Now, net strengths between these two groups. This is all the categories, not just the top 10. This is all 40 categories and all 37 liabilities. If you add up all the strengths and subtract off all the liabilities, these are the differences between these two groups. So creative leaders have a total net strength, strengths minus liabilities of 884 versus total liabilities, net liabilities of 85. It's a tenfold difference in terms of the number, but actually one is strength and the other is liability. So it's a big difference. 
We'll come back to this number. The question becomes, in terms of scaling leadership, are you getting a multiple on your leadership or are you canceling yourself out? Leadership's about scale. It's about getting a multiple. For every hour I put out, I want to get a, a tenfold, hundredfold back if I'm leader, especially if it's a senior leader. So are you getting a multiple or in your own way? And we actually talk about leadership this way. I can't believe it. He's, he's in his own way. I wish he'd get out of his own way. She just undid a, a, a year's worth of work in four minutes in that meeting. Right? I love this one. Uh, he keeps stepping on a rake. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so we got curious about this. And we, said, we looked at some of the numbers another way. Here's the top 10 strengths of reactive leaders opposite the top 10 liabilities of reactive leaders. What do you notice? The one-to-one -one correspondence. One-to-one. -one. So literally, uh, passion, very driven, very passionate, but ineffective in their interaction style, 61, 63. Visionary, but not a team player. Uh, strong networker, but doesn't develop the team. Technical domain knowledge, but over demanding, results focused, but micromanages, Te intelligent, but doesn't hold the team accountable. Yeah, there's some people skills there, but actually pretty poor listener. I mean, you go, you go right down the list, it's like, we call this the canceling effect. It's huge. We see it all the time. But to really frame it up this way and the way that the le senior leaders describe it, it's just amazing. So are you getting a multiple on your strength or are you canceling yourself out? And then does this scale? Is this built for scale? Especially in a world where we're moving toward more agile, more creative, more innovative, more adaptive, more resilient kind of organizational structures, is this gonna work? And then you add to that that six out of the top 10 are non-differentiating strengths. Now, that's the old stuff, this is the new stuff. Full spectrum of development. So we did that, we added to this study. We, did, we just talked about these two groups, right? Now, these two groups come in. So what we're looking at is can leaders describe the full spectrum of leadership uh, as it goes from high reactive to high creative? And how do they do that? So I'm gonna fly through this because there's a lot of interesting, so just here are the profiles, uh, high, high creative, Mid-creative, mid-reactive, high-reactive, right? So the profile is very different. You would expect that because we sorted for this, right? And yet the statisticians, again, were surprised by the effect size differences between these groups. They were all over one, meaning very different groups in terms of how they'd show up effectively. So another way to look at that, here are the average percentile scores in the top half of the circle. So here's the creative scores in blue. So at the, at the high creatives have average scores in the top half at about 90% and then it cascades down to an average score of about 10%. Right? Here are the leadership effectiveness scores for those same groups. Parallel. We see this, we saw it in the correlation, 0.93, so you expect this didn't click right here. Here's the reactive scores. Inverse. Same stair-step pattern. Here are the comment scores. Remember net strengths, strengths minus liabilities? Well, I converted it to a one to 100 scale with creative leaders being 100, and then each number fell out. There's the net strength score on a one to 100 scale. Literally parallels the quantitative data. Now, as a researcher, as somebody who is like, this is too good to be true, but true. Leaders see the full spectrum. So let's look at this another way. Top five strengths of, of creative leaders. Top five liabilities of reactive leaders, right? 
This is, on this page, these are the first page, right? All right, let's see how these move when we're moving through the spectrum. So here's the ratio of strength to liability of the cre high creative group in the top five strengths in blue, top five liabilities. So the ratio is 8.8 .8 to one. And the leadership effectiveness score is the arrow in green which goes off the chart here, it's at 88%. Now watch what happens. Mid-creative, ratio drops to two, 2.6, still a good positive ratio. More strength and liability, the effectiveness score goes to about the 60th percentile. Mid-reactive, now we're close to one to one ratio, 1 to 1.4 to one. Effectiveness score is down around the 40th percentile. High creative, high reactive group. 0.6 to one ratio. More liability than strength. Effectiveness scores at about 10%. So I just clicked through this. Look what happens. The rate, rate relationship between the quantitative and the qualitative is stunning. One more view of this. I love this view. Bubble charts. <laughs> in blue are strengths, in red are liabilities. In white, non-differentiating strength. The size of the bubble, pretty much the size of the score, relative size of the score. This is how leaders see uh, high creative leaders. Here's how they see high reactive leaders. Whoops. Wrong deck. Uh, Mid-creative, we'll just scale through it. Mid-creative. Mid-reactive. High-reactive. Think about that. High-reactive. Mid-reactive. Mid-creative. High-creative. Very different, equally talented. As you move, blue diminishes, red increases, non-differentiating strengths start to show up in greater numbers. So what? So what? A few minutes with your partner, so what? What strikes you about the full spectrum of leadership now, this notion? What are the implications of this? What we've seen since the last conversation. And as you're doing that, the pictures will scroll like a loop uh, while you're talking. Three minutes, go.
finish up, please. So, there's a lot here. I started by saying, most studied, least understood. I'm not sure that's actually true. What we're seeing is that leaders can describe the full spectrum pretty accurately. What works, what doesn't, what from effective to ineffective, creative to reactive, that whole spectrum in between. And frankly, with the FEX I scores we have here, I know we could slice it finer and we'd see uh, more of the same. So very discriminating uh, in terms of how we describe leadership. So what's that mean? The wisdom's in the system. How well do you harvest it to develop leaders in the organization? Because they see you with great precision. And Lisa's going to talk a bit about this in some of our conversation about how do you develop a deliberately developed mental organization. Because it's all here. Now I think we know how to develop it. And that's going to be the focus for the rest of our day. So I want to distill out a few principles for change. Shift your mindset. Creative and reactive, very different structures. Now, this comes from the work of Bob and Lisa. Adults, if they evolve, can evolve through very different stages of adult development, different mindsets, you know, and with each evolution in your inner game, you're more adapted to meet complexity, more mastery to meet complexity. It's like you're running DOS, upgrade to Windows, right? And on to Windows 10 or whatever. So I don't have time to get into all this. Very powerful work. Um, but the basic shift that most adults are in are from reactive to creative. Or in Keegan's language, Lisa's language, from, self uh, from um, uh, socialized to self-authored. So moving from authored by others, being managed by the expectations of those around me. And if you think about it, if I'm worried about how I'm doing and trying to manage to your expectations, then I'm actually in a play not to lose game. Some form of self-protection or self-promotion, trying to advance my objectives by not falling from grace. Versus authored by self, discerning out of all the messages from the surround, well, what matters to me? What's worthy of my deepest commitment? and getting oriented on um, a purpose that seems to want to come through. That's self-authored. It's a fundamental shift of mind, and it has huge implications for leadership. So here's our take on reactive structure. Removes the core strength. Removes the core strength. Introduces competing liabilities and doesn't scale. You've seen it this way, right? We talked about the canceling effect. Well, we did another study. We wanted to see if leaders could describe the predominant patterns that we see in the model, the, the way the whole model's constructed. And it's constructed around tensions in opposite, opposite forms of behavior. Do leaders describe that in their comments? Now, uh, so I need to kind of walk you through this. So here's one pattern from complying to achieving. Now over here in achieving is I lead from a place of purpose, vision, uh, translated into strategy, and then I get really focused on results and execution and decisiveness. No brainer, that's highly correlated to effectiveness, right? Complying is inverse to that and pretty strongly so. It's, it, it's people oriented, it's heart centered, that's its gift, but it gives up power in order to be accepted. Now I got onto this really early in my career, and some of you know this story. This is how I got onto this, actually. I'm in the middle of a, a management structure, I'm a consultant to the senior team, I'm really frustrated with their leadership, and they're the, they're the problem or so I think. It wasn't until 
uh, I was given some pretty good feedback <laughs> that I got really clear I want to lead, I want to be an agent of change in the organization, and I got to have everybody like me. <sighs> Especially those above me and whom, with whom I vest my future. To fall from grace, to not be acceptable, to walk in the face of disapproval, mm, not okay. My worth is in their hands. My future is in their hands. It's a false structure, but a lot of us have it, and that's what we call complying. Strength is people, but I give up power for harmony. And that costs me on the achieving side. So let's see how leaders describe this. First of all, in our data, complying is inverse to relating. Think about that. Complying is inverse to relating. So the stronger I, I, I'm, like I'm a people-oriented person, but the more I give up power for harmony, the less effective I am in relationship. So here's how, here's the, here's the profile we sorted. We went to our database, this is the new study, and we sorted for really high complying leaders. Well, we found them. <laughs> Looks like this. Then we said, how do leaders describe this group? Ed needs to stop worrying about what others think. Focus on team, improvement, results, and so on. He needs to take a stand on his business positions, feelings, and support them with facts. He shouldn't change his positions to please others when controversy happens. Many of his employees, peers, believe that he's more of a yes man than a person will actually commit to making things change for the better. Great description of a complying leader. And here's the data. So these are comment scores. Right? The strength side of it, strong people skills, calm demeanor, easy to work with, good listener, team builder, these are people's strengths. Collaborator, so leaders see the strength. Now, canceled strength, gift removed. Too reserved, too deferential, lacks confidence, worries too much about what others think, avoids conflict, distant, aloof. Those are the people's strengths removed. Now over on the achieving side, competing liabilities, poor decision making, vision's not articulated, doesn't hold the team accountable, doesn't engage with staff, not a team player, so on. Lacks passion, drive. They could write the manual on what high complying leadership looks like. So leaders see the pattern, describe it with great precision. Over here, high controlling. Here, I take up power, but it's power over people, not power with. Highly driven, but it's in your face, right? So it's opposite relating, and so as high controlling goes out, relationship stuff comes down, and we've already seen how important that is to leadership. Here's the profile we isolated. And notice this is very high controlling. There's some protecting, uh, not much complying. So we're isolating a high controlling set of leaders. Here's the kind of comments we see. John's really passionate about the success of the company, but he sometimes lets his passion get the better of him. He pushes others too hard, demands more than they can deliver. You can add this to the reptilian charisma. And um, <laughs> so gifts, strengths, right? There's real strength here. Drive, passion, vision, results, focus, creative, innovative, courage. But push it too hard, you cancel it out. Over demanding, micromanage, impatient, too detailed. Right? 186 minus 200. And then on the relationship side are the competing liabilities. An effective interaction style, not a team player, an attentive poor listener, too self-centric, lacks emotional control, and flexible. Strength removed, competing liabilities, canceled out. I'm not saying this, this is just putting, putting comments in boxes, right, of what leaders say. High protecting, so this is power, will, this is heart, people, this is head, rational. Strengths are rational. When I overplay it, it's a problem. 
Got some feedback on my last profile that I'm a little arrogant. Talk more about that. So uh, strength overplayed, problematic. So here's the profile, high protecting, pretty good controlling mixed in there, but high protecting, and you get the strengths seen. Now notice the rational strength, yeah, visionary, strong technical skills, driven, results focused, smart, intelligent, strategic thinker, passionate. A lot of rational strength there. Take it off the table, over demanding, vision's not articulated, and you can read the list. Competing liabilities can be across the board. One that, one that really strikes me is puts people down. So down here we have a thing on critical, which is opposite courage. At courage, I level with you. At critical, I level you. A big difference, right? And so uh, puts others down publicly, humiliates, favoritism, so on. Not built for scale. Actually in your own way but brilliant. So I'm going to take a time out from this theme we're on of shift your mindset. As the creator of the leadership circle, this data is blowing me away, frankly. Leaders can describe the full spectrum from high reactive, mid reactive, high creative with great precision and they actually describe the core organizing theory and framework that's built into the whole profile. And they do it with great precision. So there's something universal about the framework. It's kind of universal that some of us uh, give up power for being acceptable. It's kind of universal that we take up power and over control in order to drive results and so on. So the model that's underneath the profile is uh, hugely validated by how leaders actually talk about leadership. You've seen this, you know. So if reactive removes strength and uh, doesn't scale, creative gets a multiple on strength introduces, gives you access to complementary competency and scales nicely. You saw this, 8.8 .8 to 1. This is, this is going to scale. Merit, now, this, when I read this, get the complementarity that's in this statement. Mary can do this and that. So Mary inspires people to enjoy working harder and smarter. She fosters an incredible team atmosphere. She does it while maintaining a strong sense of honesty and directness. As opposed to just rah-rah type leadership, she's not afraid to point out areas that need improvement. So when she endorses another idea, that person feels a true sense of accomplishment, a strong desire to do it again. This is challenge with support. This is creating a really positive environment that holds you accountable. That's the complementarity. And so in the creative mindset, if you lay the comments out on the circle, you can be driven and passionate with strong people skills. Visionary and develop the team. Results focus and empower people. Technical domain and approachable. Good technical stuff, good domain knowledge, but very approachable, and so on. Mastery in leadership is agility. Mastery in leadership is the fluid access or movement between strengths. You don't have that agility or fluidity in a reactive structure. You default to a way of driving something making it happen. So shift your mindset, serve something larger than yourself. This one stood out in the comment study. Here is the core motivation for highly reactive leaders. Core motivation. So I just pulled out some themes here. Yeah, very visionary, strong passion and drive. Uh, not much at servant leadership. 
Commitment to organizational success, some, but personal success way higher and self-centric drive uh, pretty strong. Look at creative leaders. Vision's higher, passion or drive comes down a little, but the kind of passion or drive is much more made up by servant leadership, commitment to organizational success than it is drive for personal success and self-centric drops to zero. So if I go back and forth, sorry, you can see the shift. The core motivating structure moves from self-centric to service centric. And so I add to this chart, that, and we're, it's interesting to me to be playing with, as we move from being authored by others, we're actually more self-centric, focused on how I'm doing. And as we move into being authored by self, oriented on a purpose that's larger than me, I move into a more of a service contribution mindset big shift. And leaders describe that shift uh, and the difference between a highly reactive and a highly creative leader. Shift your mindset, serve something larger than yourself. Now Lisa's going to talk a lot about this, so I'm going to hit this really quickly. The question then becomes, how do you work this in a practical way? How do I make the shift on my arrogance? Well, first of all, I gotta see it. So, identify the one thing that if you shifted it, would unlock your leadership. And the leaders give us a pretty good list. If you take the top half of the circle, and the kind of strengths that show up there, and the way leaders describe that in this language, you got a pretty good starting place for, if I could do better at that, it would take my leadership to the next level. It would unlock my capability here. So get that in focus. Then, how do I cancel myself out? How do I get in my own way? We got 11 dimensions here on reactive structure and approaches, and then you got a pretty good list from leaders that say, here's what doesn't work. Which one of these do I run habitually and cancel out my effectiveness or diminish it to some degree? Get them in focus and establish creative tension around them. Now this is a powerful model. We don't have time to develop it fully this morning, but it is a transformational model. So how do you, how do you shift? How do you create anything? Creating outcomes that matter. In the creative orientation, the focus is on creating something that matters most. So vision, results that matter, that I care about. Not any vision will do. It either matters or it doesn't. I'm either passionate about it, it's worthy of my life's commitment or not. And who do I want to be? How do I want to show up in the midst of that? So get that in focus and distill it. And one, one aspect of distilling it is what's the one big thing that if I shifted it would open it all up? So how do I get that in sharp focus and put intention behind it? Intention. Full commitment. It's bigger than willpower. It's actually soul power. When I see how that shift uh, opens me up to contribute and create the life I came here to live, you now have soul power behind that intention. It's very powerful. Then, how do I get in my own way? Tell the truth about current reality. Here's the thing, if I can tell the truth about what really matters and at the same time tell the truth about how I get in my own way or how, what, how I'm showing up, I create a tension resolution system. It's a force. The gap is a force. Tension seeks what? I don't have my rubber band. It broke yesterday when I was doing a demonstration, but if I had a rubber band, I put it in tension, right? What's it seek? Release. Tension seeks resolution. It's a principle. So when I tell the truth about what I want, and I tell the truth about what I've got, then the natural tendency over time is for current reality to move toward vision. But there are two big ifs. Because we talk ourselves out of what we want real fast. 
not possible, not realistic, not going to happen. What will others think? And how many meetings are you in where um, people tell the truth? Will Shoots, one of the great mentors in this field, once started a meeting like with this. Okay, who's who's not going to tell the truth today? Or what are we about today? <laughs> I can do both over time, uh, I up the probability. But telling the truth about current reality often and, and vision creates tension or anxiety, the other kind of tension, anxiety. And our natural tendency is to try to get that to go away. Easiest way to do that, chop the vision down to size or lie about current reality. Either way, I feel better, but creative tension is resolved. What, what we suggest here is hold on stay focused, intentional, and get underneath the anxiety. Lisa's going to walk through a very powerful process for doing this. Underneath is a story we're making up. Underneath that are beliefs and assumptions we're running on a habit. And then seeing, seeing the relationship between how I'm thinking moment to moment and the kind of results and behavior that I'm running, that's telling the truth about current reality. So now notice what we're doing. We're setting higher intention and we're working on our inner game operating system, restructuring it, if you will, in order to be more capable of creating what matters most. That's the creative tension structure. So shift the mindset. And this is a big mindset shifting structure. And you can see how it orients you on something larger than yourself. And then um, take a long-term systemic approach and create a feedback-rich environment. Most of our approaches to development are short-term, episodic, non-systemic. And remember, the wisdom's in the room. Do we create our leadership development efforts, if not our entire organizational culture, around harvesting what that means. So we've developed a leadership system. It's a play on words. How do I develop? This is a play on words. So we're taking a systemic approach to the development of the leadership system of an organization. Now, I talked about this last year, so I'm going to cut through this. But um, we did a, a case study with a guy by the name of Mike Jett at Honda. And the reason I want to do it again is because we now have his third profile. Last year, we had two. So I'll walk you through this. So Mike, big job. Parts, uh, parts plant manager. They manufacture transmissions just in time for all the Honda, Honda uh, vehicles made in North America and Canada. 200,000 square foot facility, $100 million facility. It's a big job. Mike runs this plant. We ran into Mike. We do a lot of work with Honda. We ran into Mike at, at a week long offsite. He got his 360 feedback and uh, cried for a week. Here was his profile. Be one of these high reactive leaders. Pretty close. Probably didn't quite fall in that category, but he'd be pretty close. All right, tough. Great conversation with Mike, great coaching session. He got some real insight. He went back to the plant. After done crying for a week, he put it on his wall and said, okay. And he started to solicit feedback. And he started to work it. In the second year, he got his whole team involved in the process, which we call the leadership system. So this is what he went through year one. And then he put his whole team through this year, too. So I'm not going to get real specific here because we don't have time. But this, we're using this now all over the world with senior leadership organizations, levels one through three and then down into four. We get the whole leadership system of the organization in a overtime process of development. It's very powerful. We start out with a profile. They get their feedback in a, in a half-day workshop. They get very powerfully introduced to the framework. Then they get a debrief. And then they get clear about the one big thing. That's part of the process. And they get clear about the one big reactive tendency. 
What would take your leadership to the next level? How are you getting in your own way? And then we create a survey out of that. Call it the Pulse Survey. So my goal, it gets written as a goal statement, actually gets written into our website as a text box and it goes out as a survey. How much progress are you making on that goal over the last quarter? And the per so you're getting feedback, right? Also, the leaders are meeting in leader-to-leader uh, -leader groups, cross-sectional groups uh, of the top layers of the organization. It's a learning community. It's designed to hold you, to coach, help coach, mentor, and hold you accountable for progress. As trust builds in these groups, they get very, very uh, powerful for change. What's actually equally important or powerful about this is we have not separated the business conversation from the development conversation. In other words, what are these leaders walking into these groups and talking about? I'm in the midst of this business issue. How do I show up more effectively? So the whole leadership organization is actually working the core business issues together and helping each other get more effective at how they're showing up individually and collectively in the middle of it all. over time. So this is what we did with Mike and it's what he did. Uh, so here's his year one profile, right? 2000, wait a minute, 14, oh that's missing. Anyway I'll put them side by side, right? So you can see here First profile, second profile. Big shift. Moved a lot of this, not all of it, moved a lot of his controlling. Look at his relating score. Big shift. If you look at his leadership quotient, remember I said one is kind of neutral? He moved from 0.39 to uh, four times that. No, three times that to 1.2. So Mike's gone from being a competitive disadvantage to being a competitive advantage over a couple year period of time. Big shift. His comment scores did the same. I won't get into all the detail here, but his total scores on strengths went from eight to 10 and a half. And his liabilities went from five and a half to two with no challenges being one. Very different way Mike was being described. If you look at it like this, He's got strengths at eight, liabilities 5.5 the first round, and then 10 to two in the second round. That's not a bad ratio. So net strengths, two, 5.5. Big difference. Here's what happened in the plant. Productivity increased. Put a pencil on this. Eight percentage points from 88 to 96. Think about the return on that investment. Safety went from nine to 0.5, lowest in the company. Incidence of injury. Quality, 90 to 19. This is an industry-wide measure. So they're setting company and industry records. Retention. 17% turnover rate. This is a very highly talented group of people. This is expensive talent. So think about what it means to shift that from 17 to six and well on their way to three. We have a lot of these stories. I just told you about the one that went from 10th percentile to 85th percentile. We're just seeing a lot of this when we plug people into the system. It's very powerful. And so uh, here's, here's Mike in 2012. Here he is in 14. If I go back and forth, you can see the shift he made from 12 to 14. And here he is in 17. 14, 17, 14, 17. So he's bumped it out another 10 percentile points. So Mike has gone over the course of this period of time from a 30 percentile effectiveness score down here all the way up.
75. Huge shift. That's Mike Jett. Great guy. So, shift your mindset. Serve something larger than yourself. Identify the one big thing that would really open it up. Establish this creative tension around the one big thing and the way I get in my own way, uh, which is a principle for how you create anything you want to create. And that's a game changer in terms of, if you really work that structure, it's a, it's a mindset shifter. And then do that, how can we create systems that are over time uh, and feedback rich, here's, my, here's the language, feedback rich, supportive, accountable. And you've got a recipe for developing and scaling leadership. Leadership effectiveness is scaling the capacity and capability of the organization to create what matters most. We think this is a business imperative. So the development of, a, of some form of development agenda like this is an imperative, especially in the complexity that's coming at us. The organizations that will thrive into the, in the future disruptive environment will be the best led. And reactive structure is simply not complex enough for the complexity that's coming at us. It doesn't scale. Furthermore, the canceling effect is not only individual. I not only cancel myself out, uh, what's the impact on the collective effectiveness? All right, great stuff. Thank you very much. It's been great to be with you. Um, yeah.